Millions. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Chris Webster here, and I just wanted to thank all the people that are members of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Of course, our shows are always free, and members are what help keep them free. Other shows are on Patreon and similar sites and make you pay for content, not at the APN. If you want a little extra and want to give back, then head over to arcpodnet.com slash members. That's arcpodnet.com slash members to support archaeological education and outreach. Let's start the episode. Welcome back to A Life in Ruins podcast, episode two. We're going to finish off the episode with our guest, uh, Ella. Ella. Yep. We'll just <laughs> No, me, you're all good. Uh, both with, yeah, hold on. Okay, give me a second. Give me a second. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, let's stop laughing. Welcome to episode two of a Life in Ruins podcast. I'm your host, Carlton. I'm your host, Connor. And I am David. Tonight's guest is someone who we wanted to snag as early as possible based on her ability to connect with the public. Ella Bodwin got started in anthropology at the American University in Washington, D.C. She cut her scientific teeth in Kenya as part of the Kubi Fora Field School. The Kubi Fora region is one of the most prolific fossil bearing regions in the world. She is currently a contractor at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, where she works to help engage and teach the public about evolution and archaeology. As a goal of this podcast is to connect non-archaeologists with our science, we are super excited to talk with her tonight. All right, Ellis, would you like to tell our guests who you are? Yeah, so hi, my name is Ella Bodwin, and I am an archaeologist. I work at, I'm a contractor at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, uh, in, specifically in the Human Origins Program. And I'm working on a grant to teach evolution in Alabama in culturally sensitive kind of ways. Uh, it's an NSF grant. It's a really cool project that I'm really lucky to be a part of. Um, so that's kind of me and my job in a tiny little nutshell. All right. So you know me, I'm David. Uh, I currently have a 103 degree fever and I'm hearing colors, but okay. So we first met in Orlando at the SAS, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I remember this because we immediately thought you were like super cool because you had this Darwin tattoo on your arm. You want to talk about that real quick? Yeah, sure. I have uh, a little band and it is in like around um, kind of my upper arm and it's just uh, Darwin's handwriting above the first phylogenetic tree. Uh, And it just says, I think. And a lot of people definitely are like, oh, I think therefore I am. And I'm like, oh, God, no. Um, (laughs) And basically the reason I got it was because like Darwin is really important to me. Obviously I'm obsessed with human evolution. Um, but I think that going, I think is kind of the best description of most of science is like, I don't know and sketch it out. So I really (laughs) liked it. Uh, so that's my tattoo. Yeah. Um, Well, cool. So like me and Connor met you there. We immediately thought like you were cool. And then, uh, (laughs) that was that SAAs where it was like, we were at the Disney, you know, campus and we had to go to the the only club we could go or bar yep. we could Disney, do was Disney dance. Clubbin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was yeah. not going to lie. That's like m- mo- my most vivid memory of like the day is just dancing with you guys truly in the weirdest club yeah, with it was very definitely weird. adult people in mini, mini mouse ears. Oh, it, it was strange because they had that like that whole wall of like it was like a TV and they were playing like 90s R&B and oh yeah it's just the most ridiculous. and then like take on me for some reason too, <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. Yeah. laughs> uh, um and then I, I also remember this I'm just like you know chatting right now uh there was a guy dancing in pajamas there every day do you remember that yes and he was and, so good yeah and you like went right over and just started dancing with them and I was like whoa are you all right and you were like no this guy can dance <laughs> <laughs> he was killing it he was absolutely yeah. killing it <laughs> yeah that was I think that was my first SAAs I think actually yeah yeah so Ooh. you guys made it infinitely better for sure <laughs> awesome <laughs> Um, so then you met Carlton in Washington, D.C., right? Carlton, you want to go from there? <laughs> yeah, um, I was hanging with you two because that was the first time I had met Connor. And you guys had said, hey, we're going to hang out with uh, this girl named Ella and her friend. Um, you need to come. And so then I did. Mm-hmm. 
and it was Crabo's birthday. And I think we were at a rooftop bar in DC. And I remember you were helping David out with one of his Tinder profiles. <laughs> and then you gave me <laughs> advice on my Tinder profile. Yes. And so we did that for about like 30 minutes. And Connor the entire time was wearing his backpack to help straighten <laughs> his back because he had just had back surgery. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Honestly, such a good time. <laughs> what was that bar we went to? It was like a rooftop bar and it was super cool. I have no, I have never been there since. And I don't oh, okay. really know where it was. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, all right. So like moving on, I guess. <laughs> Um, what I think another thing that's super cool about you is I didn't know this until like you randomly told me like a year ago, but your parents are British. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. My mom, my mom is English and, um, she was born and raised in the UK and then moved over to the U S later in life for a job. And that's where she met my dad. And my dad was born in Germany, but grew up all over the world. So he primarily grew up in Singapore and Sweden. Uh, and then moved to the United, the United States, I think, in his senior year of high school. If he hears this, he's going to correct me. I, I can't <laughs> remember. But he moved uh, then back to the U.S. Um, later okay. on. How how does that affect, uh, you know, your view of or your perspective in anthropology? I think that would, you know, I mean, my background definitely, like, makes me feel more of an anthropologist, you know? Mm -hmm, yeah. No, I think I honestly was really lucky because – Going, you know, at least going back to England as often as we could to kind of see my extended family and my grandparents. One thing that's kind of different from England versus Minnesota, which is where I grew up, right, is that the buildings are older, the towns are older, like archaeology is much more kind of close in every day. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that probably for a lot of people who live, you know, in the South or the, like the Southwest of the United States are much more in contact with archaeology than I think I was in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where we, all we had was like Fort Snelling. And never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Um, being able to kind of go and be a part of like, oh, yeah, let's go to the cathedral that was built, you know, however many centuries ago. Um, and kind of as a kid and getting to be up close and personal with history in a way, right. I think definitely influenced my interest in it at an early age. Yeah. Yeah. When I was um, in London in November of this past year, mm -hmm. I was like walking down the block and I saw this sign that was like been open for 700 years. <laughs> and I like looked at it and I like kept walking and then I like double take and I was like, what the fuck? And then I remembered <laughs> that that's like a thing there. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. I definitely my I don't have super clear memories of uh, of this particular instance. But my parents do is like when they took me to the British Museum for one of the first times, yeah. like as a really little kid, like eight or something. And they said that I spent almost an hour talking to like one of the volunteers who had like a cart out. And basically Nerd. was just like, this is what I just need to talk and ask questions as like a very <laughs> little kid. Yeah, definitely. Nerd. Yeah. <laughs> and so they really remember that I have no memory. But uh, I think they they knew from a pretty early age, because I also sent my mom sent me a picture of what I did to my Barbies as a child, which was mummify them. I truly, I wrapped them up in a bunch of, bunch of uh, like gauze and stuff. Uh, and she found them in the basement recently. So nice. I, don't know. <laughs> I used to uh, bury GI, they're GI Joes and like Max Steel, like the off brand one. Um, yes. And I'd bury them, I'd wrap them in toilet paper and then like Excellent. bury them underground. And I would dig Love them up it. the next year. And I was like, look at this mummies, guys. <laughs> and tried to like convince my friends that they were like there the whole, I didn't put them there, you know? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Wow. It's like tell, retelling these stories. You're like, oh wow, we were weird kids. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, yeah, like I used to go to the Denver museum all the time and I would get mm -hmm. just lost in the, the dinosaur section and I wouldn't want to leave, you mm -hmm. know, I just like, it's, it's so cool how a bunch of like museums and stuff like kind of get us all and keep us interested in, in anthropology. Yeah. I mean, like museums are so obvious. I mean, this is kind of goes without saying, but they are so integral to like a lot of people's first steps into this like STEM fields, you know, whether you become a physicist or whether you study, you know, do paleontology, it seems to be that like a lot of these kind of stories end up originating as a child in a museum. Did you just say integral? Yes. Is that not? <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> you win the word for the day. <laughs> What the fuck is that? I love that. I mean, I, I just started it, so there we go. Oh. <laughs> 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 
Okay. Um, well, well, so so kind of building off of that, um, mm-hmm. did you have any other your childhood experiences in other fields of science, or was it kind of this history, archaeology? Yeah. No. Um. I at. Oh God, I think I was 11. I turned, I either turned 11 or I turned 12. So I applied to be part of the National Geographic Kids magazine had a contest uh, many, many years ago now. Um, It was like their first contest. And they said, you know, that I think it was 15 students from all over the US. You had to submit a, like a little short story and a photo of a place in your community that you actively explore and they pick 15 of us or, um, that would then go to the Galapagos Islands and like learn about exploration and Darwin and evolution so and cool. ecology. And I applied and won. Um, so that was kind of like where I first really learned about Darwin was at a very early age in the Galapagos. Um, we were part of like staying on a Lindblad expeditions boat with all of our parents. We got to bring one of, one of our parents, which my mom came with me. Um, was and that, that a hard choice? Like, were they upset? <laughs> my, <laughs> I think my mom was the one who showed me um, <laughs> the thing. Was like, you should do this because. So she gets like finders. Cool. <laughs> she yeah. got finders keepers, kind of. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, could you speak yeah. for those people who are not like um, in, in tune with kind of or haven't heard about the Galapagos Island? Could you explain to our our viewers, you know? what the Galapagos Islands, Islands were and how they kind of influenced Charles Darwin. Yeah, of course. Uh, they are a, a set of islands. And, and dear, I really hope either in post-production, you'll help me if I sound dumb here, but like, or if I get something wrong. Um, so the Galapagos Islands are a chain of islands that are off the coast of Ecuador. Um, and they're really important because they were a stop uh, on Darwin's Beagle journey. So the Beagle was the boat he went on as a young man that traveled all over the world and kind of was where he kind of got to see this kind of broad sweep of biological diversity um, and start to think, okay, wait a second. We understand, you know, like how old is the earth really? I know that like I heard, and I don't know if this is fully true, but I know that he was looking at like, it, you know, in Cape Town, he was looking at um, the uh, mountains there and saying, okay, what is geologic time in the context of like, these must be much older than, you Yeah, know. didn't he bring Lyell's like textbooks with him? Um, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Or something. I think you like noticed that off like Argentina, Argentina too, kind of the, the, the cliffs and the depths that yeah, like, exactly, a right? Lot of time yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, like, you know, geologic time is so, it's kind of the main thing that we have to understand when we start thinking about kind of broad scale, deep time evolution. And he started, uh, he, on these islands, he kind of started looking at the birds and the animals, and he realized that from island to island, there were these like small changes between the different species. And that was really dependent on the food and the environment that changed between these islands. And so this is kind of where he started to think and formulate a, his concepts of evolution um, and where he collected a lot of his specimens and a lot of the specimens that are in museums all over the world today. Um, and everyone, or hopefully, you know, a lot of people kind of know the image of Darwin's finches with the changes in beaks um, that, you know, so a small population of birds was blown from Ecuador to different islands and then evolved specific to each of those islands. I hope that. No, that yeah. was, first of all, we're not going to add out any of that because that was amazing. You killed it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'd also like to mention, like, I just realized, like, we've so far both of our guests have been associated with National Geographic kids in some way. Oh, okay. yeah. Cool. You know Spencer, right? Oh, yeah. I didn't know he was an associate with Nat, Nat Geo Kids. Well, his was with uh, bears, not necessarily anthropology. Ah. So, uh, you know, point for you. <laughs> nice. So where did you do uh, your undergraduate work at? Or, I mean, I guess, yeah. how did that transition between, like, high school to college? Did you, like, were you yeah. interested in anthropology in high school and then decided to do it in college? Yeah. So I, in high school, I went to a performing arts high school very small one where I did theater and I majored in theater. Um, and I kind of had already always known I wanted to either do archeology span or childcare and not theater. (laughs) 
those were like my two kind of, I loved kids and I loved archaeology and history. And so I took a gap year to kind of figure out where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do in, in, um, in college. So a little caveat here, like I'm incredibly privileged, um, my family, you know, like, and that is something that I have to really acknowledge in a lot of this journey is that I have a lot of opportunities that people probably wouldn't have had because of my race and, um, kind of socioeconomic status. So I just do want to put that out there, like that a lot of this, I have to be very cognizant is not necessarily the, the same path that a lot of other people take. Sure. Yeah. But I took a gap year and I went and worked at two different archaeological sites. Um, one, Vindalanda, uh, which is on the border of Hadrian's Wall in England. Uh, and it's a Roman fort site. Really interesting, fascinating research, amazing museum. And then a uh, 13th to 15th century burial site in Romania at the Black Church in Brasov. And that one, I did not know it would be skeletons, kind of when I decided to volunteer. And then I, I traveled around doing backpacking in India and then um, uh, worked in Tanzania, which again, you know, issues with voluntourism. So there are issues with, so there was some voluntourism there, especially when it comes to working with, I was working in an orphanage in Tanzania for three months and there are problematic things that I've come to realize as an adult and as someone who's then done anthropological research and taking classes and courses on that later on. That though, when I was in Tanzania, I kind of realized I want to do work on the continent of Africa. And from doing the archaeology, I kind of realized, okay, who I like this way more than I like kids. So, <laughs> so that was kind of where... The cry list. <laughs> yes. Well, I don't know. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I cry more. I don't know. <laughs> so that was kind of where I, I figured out, okay, definitely want to do archaeology. And then I ended up going to American University in Washington, D.C. And a lot of the reason why I chose American was they had a solid archaeology program at the time. And they were in D.C., which was a big city. They had access to the Smithsonian's uh, and they had a really good um, study abroad program which I never ended up doing anything with study abroad with AU, but uh, the Smithsonian angle really worked out Absolutely. for me. Didn't you work at Kubifora? Yes. So the Kubifora Field School is an amazing program that I was a student in, and that is in Kenya on the shores of Lake Turkana, and it's where you take, we take undergraduate students and, um, and graduate students and kind of show them the ropes of what it means to do paleoanthropology uh, each student has a specific program or like a, a project that they work on. So it was this really cool way to kind of get in, get my start in, okay, how do you do a research project? How do you dig yeah. in this environment? And how do you work with data that you kind of haven't, you can't really get or see or understand as well if you haven't been digging it up yourself or kind of understanding all the mechan all the the things that go into it. So I was yeah. a student there and then came back as an intern and kind of like quasi staff member later on for a previous year. That's cool. Yeah. Well, yeah and, and that's how we like, that's how archaeologists kind of archaeologists and paleo anthropologists get there. Um, uh, it's not like a certification, but it's a way to certify that you've done field work. Exactly. Because that field school is kind of important to like all archaeologists and paleo anthropologists to you know, continue in the field for sure. Yeah, yeah it kind of sure. weeds out the people that just aren't, you know, cut out for it, you know? Yeah, true. I mm. think there are yeah, definitely a lot of people who go in being like, wow, yes. Like I went in thinking I'm going to be bones forever. I love some bones and truly they're very difficult and I'm very bad at it. <laughs> and I came out realizing that like lithics and in, you know, and talking to people were the two things that I love the most out of archaeology. So... Well, on that note, we're going to cut to our first break. Are you ready to upgrade your GPS so you can use your phone or tablet to map data? Want to use mapping software of choice on your tablet of choice? What about submeter or subfoot accuracy? Ready to get your GPS position fixed faster than you ever have in the past? I mean, come on, we all know how long that can take. Contact the GPS experts at Anatom Geo Mobile Solutions to help transition to the latest mapping technology. Visit agsgis.com. That's agsgis.com or call 1 800 980 
4649. These guys are pretty great, and I've used some equipment from them. And Matt Alexander, who is the VP of Sales, is an awesome person and will help you figure out exactly what you need. So AGSGIS.com, 1-800-980-4649. Hey everyone, Chris Webster here to tell you about all the awesome APN swag over at our T Public store. Check it out at arcpodnet.com slash shop. You'll find APN stuff, but also some great designs that we've had submitted. Get your Bruce Trigger Warning cell phone case or your Bottle Guide t-shirts. So find the link at arcpodnet.com slash shop. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop. Hello, and we're back. I'm um, continuing our conversation with uh, Ella Boudois. We're going to first talk about um, your coup before uh, experience, and we're going to get into uh, kind of the work that you've done with the Miso- uh, Smithsonian where you work. Um, so could you explain to our viewers uh, what coup before is and like why it's so significant to the field of anthropology as a whole? So coup before is an incredibly important place for paleoanthropology as a whole because it's part of the Rift Valley. Uh, And the Rift Valley is uh, this kind of geological formation where the continents are kind of coming apart a little bit. And what that means is that there is a lot more erosion. There are basically ways at which we can get to these kind of deeper, older sediments. So the law... um, Superposition. Thank you. So that law uh, means that basically everything that's on the bottom is the oldest and then kind of working your way up to the top, which is like what we're standing on now is then the newest. And so with this rift, we're kind of getting this this slice backwards in time. Uh, and so Kubifora uh, is located in, this pla- in, in a place where we have these sediments that date back, you know, hundreds uh, just like thousands of years. And it's a really cool place that has been worked on for many, many years. It's full of fossils in essence. And there are lots of stone tools. I need to say something really quick. Um, it actually, I just said good old Lyell and I am really dumb because it was actually Nicholas Steno who came up with uh, superposition. So I'm just going to take a step back and cry. <laughs> Don't worry. We're, we're all in it together. That's what we have books for. It's like whenever yeah. anyone's like, Oh, let me ask you this question. You must know it off the top of your head. No, I don't. I got the internet. I'll look it up. <laughs> like I'll look in a book. But they, uh, so a lot of the, a lot of the specimens that from like early hominids and a decent amount of them and a decent amount of the stone tools come from Kubi 4, yes. right? Yeah. Tons of them come from Kubi 4. And a lot of reason for that is not only are, it's a really well studied site because we can figure out the ge- the geology of the area has been really, really well done. Um, and so it becomes a more studied site because when you can date a fossil, you then have a lot more kind of, you can do a lot more interpretation uh, uh, about that fossil, obviously, if there is really easy or good dating. So it's been worked on for many, many years by from the Leakies to uh, Jack Harris um, to kind of all sorts of paleoanthropologists um, today. Those are the people who kind of started the the paleoanthropology, like the Leakies are, are kind of in that yeah, like, they're one of the most well-known, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, they're like the kind of, I think there's some jokes about them being the first family of paleoanthropology. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So they've been working in the region for many, many years. But the Kubi 4, like Kubi 4 Field School uh, has been working there as well um, for many, many years as well. Uh, kind of training students, having them cut their teeth, I guess, on all those rocks. It's not a bad place to start at all. Definitely yeah. not. I definitely not. Um, it definitely we do. It definitely is the hardest field experience that I've ever had, for sure, or one of the hardest, just because it's so hot and so exhausting. And also, you know, you're in a camp of you know however many people for six weeks, and you can't you can't walk away because if you go over a outcrop and you get lost, you'll die. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, it's definitely kind of makes you realize. Yeah, where you want to be uh, when it yeah. comes to archaeology. Um, so fabulous, absolutely fabulous. But we definitely want to talk about um, your work uh, in the Smithsonian. So, could you go ahead and like just kind of talk about what you do there, um, what wing you work in, and just like how the experience has been? Yeah, of course. Um, so, I'm a contractor uh, at the Smithsonian uh, Natural History Museum, and where I'm specifically kind of placed is in the Human Origins Program. 
Um, so they're the ones who they do a lot of other research all over the world. Um, Dr. Dr. Rick Potts, Dr. Brianna Popener, Jennifer Clark are kind of the main heads of the program. I am on specifically a contract that is an NSF grant to teach evolution in Alabama. So it's called the Luda Project, which is, oh dear God, learning unity and diversity in Alabama. And it's this really cool program that is working with Alabama teachers to provide a curriculum that is sensitive of the things that might be stopping students from coming to scientific thought as a whole, in my opinion. Again, some, a lot of this is my, you know, my view of it. So don't take this as like the word of the grant. But in essence, Alabama is a state that doesn't have really high evolution um, belief um, in general. It is one of the, it's a state that used to, uh, and I'm not entirely sure if it still does, have the stickers on textbooks that say, you know, evolution is just a theory. But recently, they just changed um, some of the requirements that they have for um, kind of what students need before they go to, to um, go to college uh, and to, or to graduate high school as well. And part of that was this kind of emphasis on diversity and the like, diversity of life and kind of evolution, like evolution kind of uh, as a whole. And so Brianna, my boss, saw this opportunity to use the name of the Smithsonian as this you know, neutral political, like non-political entity to create a curriculum that teachers would be looking for with this new standard happening that could help students kind of come to evolution. And there've been a lot of studies that show that understanding evolution, understanding its mechanisms allows students to do better in sciences as a whole, no matter kind of what area of STEM you end up in. Um, right. So what I do as part of that grant is I'm project manager. So I'm in contact with the teachers. I go to Alabama with another colleague to do focus groups and kind of watch how they are teaching different, you know, specifically the beginning part of the curriculum, which is where they get to talk about the religious faith or other cultural things that might be influencing why they might be hesitant to come to evolution to the, the students themselves. I make memes for the Twitter, <laughs> um, which... So you're a professional yeah, meme maker? I am a professional meme maker. I really want to put that on my, my office door. Um, I which I've been really enjoying mostly what I did today. And then also helping out with kind of anything really around the office as well that needs, needs doing. So whether that's compiling uh, literature for a paper or grabbing more envelopes, it's kind of all sorts of stuff, but primarily it's this grant that we work on uh, answering questions to the website as well. So questions that people have about evolution or just the origin of humanity in general. A lot of Sasquatch questions. <laughs> to try my so, best to answer. Yeah. For sure. So do you like do you like the aspects of your job that involve, you know, being in not just being in an office all the time, but also interacting with people? Is that something you enjoy about it? Dislike it or Oh my God, I love it. God, yeah. talking to people is the best part of my job. And definitely getting a chance to kind of talk about something that you love and that you're passionate about, but, but also what I've really loved, I think the most in conjunction with kind of talking to people is learning how to talk to people, learning how to talk about evolution, learning how to talk about stone tools in a way that other people will understand and allow people to come to it in a different yeah. way. Cause I think before I was part of this grant, you know, I'd go like, Oh my God, and here's the bulb of percussion and, blah, blah, you know, and, <laughs> and while people would kind of stare at me and nod, I didn't know how much information was really happening. So being able to be a part of this grant, being able to shadow some of my mentors, you know, who've been doing science education for years, uh, has been really wonderful. And I think that's honestly one of my favorite parts is like just learning more about how to communicate science effectively. Yeah, it's, 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 it can be extremely difficult, especially with like flint napping and all those topics, because yeah. it's, you know, once you understand it, it's good. But actually explaining it to, to someone or to anyone who has, because we're so far away from using stone tools anymore. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it's just, and even just like hearkening back to, you know, we were talking about deep time, you know, a little bit ago. That is so an integral to people understanding evolution. And it just that concept is so difficult. I sometimes get really like, you know, at night when you like shut your eyes and you're like, Oh my God, the earth is so old. And then you're like, huh. you know, that is still a process I'm struggling with. And so it's awesome to 
try and explain that in other ways. I don't know. And real quick, could you just explain um, just briefly what flint napping is and what a bulb of percussion is for viewers who might not know? Yes. So flint napping is the process by which you make a stone tool where you basically, very simple, you take one rock um, that's harder than another rock um, and you smash them together to make flakes, which are kind of sharp slices of rock. There are some more that go into it. You need specific attributes um, to be able to make a stone tool. And the bulb of percussion, though, is a really kind of is very indicative of, of a stone tool. So it's basically the force that leaves your hand and enters the rock. It's an engineering thing that I don't fully understand, but some an engineer explained it to me the other day and I was like, oh, cool. And then forgot I forgot how to explain it. Is it conchoidal fractures? Is that what you're looking for? Well, yeah, it's it's like how why it creates the bulb of percussion and then like the force sure. enters the rock, it kind of billows up and then tapers out. So when you have a flake, which is that sharp cutty thing, the <laughs> kind of top of it is kind of thick. I like to yeah. imagine it like a little tummy. And then <laughs> and then the end of it kind of tapers out to that thin, sharp edge. So that's the bulb percussion. Well, and identif- identifying that stuff is huge for anything we do in archaeology, especially for the early early paleo stuff. Is- I mean, basically, yeah. up until you get like to the Neolithic when pottery becomes a thing, like you really need bones and... And, yeah, stone um, tools are the only like, things that preserve to you know study. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that's what I always say is that like one of the reasons why I love stone tools so much is that they are the only thing that we have that is any sort of indication, really, but like of constant behavior. What are these people doing? How are they thinking? And like these are cre- things that they were creating and leaving along the landscape. And like yes, we have cut marks, and we can kind of understand okay when were they accessing meat, but at least for me, it's the stone tool is this kind of active part of creation that is so essential to us being alive today. Deep. All right. (laughs) Well, (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, so did we kind of cover your everyday grind or would you want to explain that? Pretty much like, yeah, my everyday grind is just like, you know, pretty much we explain that. Um, The good thing is, and the amazing part about working for also some of like your idols and your mentors is, so I work I have the summers to do field work. Um, so last summer I went out with Brianna um, to a different site in Kenya um, called Olpegida, which is a basically a big animal reserve. It's where the, you know, the rhino that is now, they're all extinct, but there's two oh. left that are women. Oh, the, the, white, the, white, the, rhino. the white rhino? Oh, okay. Yeah, northern white rhino. I bought the loud. Sure. The, <laughs> that one. That's where they are. Oh, so oh very cool. The, very cool. Yeah. Yeah, My that was, field project was in uh, Kentucky, so you got that cool. going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was fun. We uh, got attacked by two buffalo, and it was very scary. And I Living cried. Oh, um, you want to talk about it? To the plane. Well, <laughs> it was my first up close gunshot. So uh, oh, we work okay. with a one of the reasons why it's super important: do not ever get out of the car ever like when you're doing a safari is because these are wild and dangerous animals. Oh yeah. So we're doing a bone survey. Um, so this is a different project that Dr. Povener does and it's looking at like, you know, are things dying in the environments they're adapted for what's preserved, you know, and looking at this and hopefully then using that as a model for the past, but we were in a really close, so we have a guard with us. And so we were in a really closed environment and there was a Buffalo hiding behind a bush and they try and hide and then they like wait for you and then they want to get you. And, and he just shot above its head. Exactly. <laughs> he shot above its head. He didn't, you know, didn't hurt it, but he needed to make it go away really fast. But of course, I, we all panicked. <laughs> well, we did what we were supposed to, but also, you know, you're supposed to climb a tree, and a lot of it's just like acacias, and they're very short, and acacias are very, very spiky trees. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so that was my last field season, which was amazing. Definitely, you know, nothing I've ever done before. I'm realizing I'm much more scared of animals than I thought I would be. So that's is fun. It, your your well, flight, does it, is your flight or your fight instinct that comes in? Oh, wow. I realized if, if I was on the Titanic, I would be pushing children out of the boat <laughs> to get in there. <laughs> get in that, that, that was my first instinct. I'm working on it. I got That's better. That's evolutionary instinct, though, you know? Like, it's, it's how it works. <laughs> Truly, like, trip my boss. Like, she goes down first. I can keep going. No. <laughs> right. Speaking about, um, you know, your evolutionary response, uh, where you work, how how do you interact with people who are who deny 
um, evolution that has taken place. If we descend great. from wolves, why were there still wolves? Great, yeah, great what? question. Very what wonderful that? variant <laughs> on, you know, if we're descended from monkeys, why are there monkeys? So that's a really great question. Uh, and I approach it on a personal level. And that's, I think, what I'm, I can talk about. There are other ways which you can talk about it that are, you know, written about in really awesome science education books. But I'll talk about like how I kind of come from, come at it. I really love the phrase, and especially if people come, are, are kind of disbelieving evolution or from a religious standpoint, I really love the phrase, your personal belief explains why. Why are we here? Why are humans important? Evolution just explains how. Yeah. It's just the little bitty how bits. And I explain it that way because, and then I kind of go into why I think evolution is one of the most beautiful things on earth because it's how mm. earth is why it, it is. And from my perspective, again, on a personal note, why would you take that beauty away from a creator? If you believe in a creator, why would you take that intricacy and that genius and that, that again, just the beauty of evolution away from, from, you know, a deity that you believe in. Yeah. And so that's how I address it on a personal note. A lot of the time when, it, especially when it comes to religious people, I don't think, you know, if you're not a member of the community, why, why should you kind of believe someone else? And I also think that like, we have to look at the roots of why people don't believe in evolution. And a lot of it too, is like, you know, especially in religious, uh, very strict, strictly religious communities, the church and those teachings are so integral and important to your way of life. Uh, and especially in like rural, you know, more rural communities in the South, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like it's like a social aspect to it. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. Right. Like your entire, like your home is part of this amazing church community. So if you, if you felt like you had to choose between believing evolution or the core of your family and social life, God, no, don't believe in evolution that, you know, you know, right. so I think a lot of it is you have to like understand, cause I used to take it really personally for years. I used to be like, well, if you don't believe in evolution, you don't respect me. And it's like, no, <laughs> that's not <laughs> the case at all. Yeah. So I answer questions when I get asked personally, I kind of, I use that phrase, you know, what, you know, evolution is, is just the how, uh, religion is the why. <laughs> that's a really interesting way to take it i really like that hmm. yeah that's also my company name but that's all right <laughs> <laughs> well perfect on that note we're gonna go ahead and take our next uh break and we'll be right back here in a bit so uh stay tuned Hey, I'm Chris Webster, and this is your Wild Note Tip of the Month for October 2019. As we move into the off-season for much of the Northern Hemisphere, you might be wondering what to do with your fancy digital data management software. Well, here are some ideas. Wild Note can be used to help catalog artifacts in the lab. Just export a pivot table and import into your existing database. Create new forms to manage proposals and report writing tasks. Not all forms for data collection have to be exported. They can just be used for organization and internal data gathering. Finally, test out new forms for the next field season. Check out our safety forms or build your own. If you aren't using WildNote yet, head over to wildnoteapp.com. That's wildnoteapp.com for all your digital data collection needs and a free trial. Hey everybody, Chris Webster here. And as we head into the off season for much of the Northern Hemisphere, it's time to buckle down and write those reports. As we all know, the time you work on the report has to be accounted for. That's where Timeular comes in. Timeular is a time tracking app, but it also has a physical component. Just flip the Timeular cube to the side that represents what you're doing, and it stops time on one task and starts it on another. Check out Timeular over at arcpodnet.com slash Timeular. That's arcpodnet dot com slash t-i-m-e-u-l-a-r welcome back to a life in ruins podcast episode two uh we're here with our guest for uh the final segment ella boduin so we're going to go ahead and, and uh, for this segment we're just going to kind of like roundtable talk about questions that we want to uh discuss with ella uh related to her personal work or just kind of what's going on um in the greater anthropological realm so uh david you're up last week i don't know if you heard um our or last month our podcast with spencer pelton but he kind of touched on this thing about, um, you know, that sense of awe that humans get from, you know, the past and like things that are, came before us. Ella, you kind of touched on this today, like about the beauty of evolution. So I just wanted to kind of say, like, I, 
I, I was raised in a household where like, that was, you know, the, the way to like, I raised agnostic, you know? So like my mm-hmm. parents were like, Oh yeah, evolution. So, so like, I didn't really have the experience that a lot of people do where they like, I grow up in a, like a household where that's, that's not a thing, you know? Yeah. Um, but at some day, like, I don't want to say like, I achieved Nirvana, man. But like, <laughs> I, I got to this point where like evolution just clicked with me, like what it is. And that's kind of why I got so into anthropology and I love hunter gatherer theory. Cause it's like, humans adhere to these evolutionary laws and like I kind of just have a thing like if I can't figure something out or I'm trying to explain something I just think about it in like an evolutionary sense and like I'm like oh that makes sense and then I'll like look it up and there's like evolutionary psychology and it's like uh, I guess I'm describing what like religion is but like (laughs) okay because I have feelings about evolutionary psychology do you okay let's fight it's a bunch of bullshit you think so? <laughs> it's a bunch of bullshit that's sexist and stupid and not based really? in science. Yeah, that's my hard, hard stance on that. Mostly huh. because I read stuff that's like, women hunter, ga- w- women gather, men hunter. And it just continually oh, also. Uh, no, no, I know you don't. Huh. Truly, we would not be friends if you did. <laughs> um, I would not be in love with you. If- oh, all right. That was the case. Nice. I had to put that oh, nice. Just put that in. Um, <laughs> good. Are we, are we all good? Yeah. Um, good. <laughs> so uh, I think it's a bunch of bullshit because I think it often relies on really bad stuff, like bad science, bad studies, because it completely ignores how influential culture is and like how we have created all of these structures around us. And I've just read so many like evolutionary psychology papers that are like, we're like this because, um, like women were looking for mates that had beards and that was, and you're like, no, like think about, okay, let's, well, that's a phenotype thing. Wouldn't it be? Well, but let's get into daddy issues, you know, like that's the thing, right? Uh-huh. Like it's, there's culture that's in this, that is such a bad example, but like there are, <laughs> There's culture that is actively influencing everything we do. And I'm more of the kind of hippy dippy side of cultural amp, even though I do study paleo, that like even the numbers we have are are semi-constructed, right? Like the reality of of understanding an archaeological site is all on scale, right? Like you have a excavation square and that could tell you something. You open up 10, that could tell you a completely different pattern. What would happen if you opened up the landscape, you know? So we're still controlling a lot of what we're finding by sample size and by scale. And I think that evolutionary psychology, just honestly, in in almost every case I've ever read, is just bad science. Huh. At least- <laughs> Fuck me. I, All right. We'll go to no, the next question. Sorry. No. <laughs> Mostly just the stuff about like, oh, you feel this way because of your biology. Yeah, yeah. No, I, you I know. Really or like when it, especially when like I really love slipping in stuff about gender as a construction when I give sure. tours. I love doing that. Being like, oh, we don't know how gender played out in the past because that does not fossilize. Right. We have no idea, you know, if there was gender uh, in the way that we understand it now. So you're down with like behavioral ecology then? Like, the- yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, but then, then evolutionary psychology, hell no. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I'm going to go rethink my whole life now. So, oh, <laughs> good. We, we can talk about it more later. Well, that's what this is podcast is for. So anyway, I'm going to take a step back and cry. So go, all right, next. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about the event that happened with Notre yes. Dame the other day in which the yes. cathedral had a horrible fire um, and burnt the uh, burnt the roof and broke a pane glass. Real quick, I know there's like a bunch of stuff going on social media that um, the gold cross was saved and people are saying it's a sign of God. However... It could be that's plausible, but the melting point of gold is much <laughs> higher than the the that, way yeah. that that like much higher than the way wood burn. burns. So like true, I do fucking say, science. True, the roof did fall on it. Just putting that out there <laughs> as being a contrarian. Yeah, fair enough. Fall. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about that because I had to like, or at least about the response to note. Like I truly watching that in real t- like watching it burn in real time was horrific. And it made me really think about the National Museum of Brazil, which 
oh, I don't yeah. think got enough press. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And like us as a museum, we talked about it a lot. We we have gone through a lot more. You know, everyone's checking the fire alarms at the Smithsonian. Um, but like some of the most important things, like with the loss of a, a building like that, is there were a lot of records of indigenous languages that were recorded before they became extinct, and now those are gone. Back up um, your stuff digitally, everybody. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's so important. We're kind of coming to realize how, how important digital, like kind of the internet is, is, is now to science just for preservation. But I also felt like I had to really critically engage with my whiteness as well. Um, because I saw like an example on Twitter, uh, I can't remember her name. She is a, a doctor uh, in anthropology and she, uh, she is native and she talked about, oh, cool, a big sparkly European church fell down. Like, who gives a shit? And my first reaction was like, oh, my God, that's so horrible. And then kind of her next tweet was like, why should I as an indigenous person care about or like be made to care about this this space that has like when, you know, this space that like is dedicated to Catholicism and Catholicism did so, so much bad stuff to my community. And I really had to like, think about how, how upset I was getting and how I don't feel that kind of straightaway fear and anger when it comes to like a lot of other kind of intangible heritage sites or other sites in general, general that are like in the Middle East that are getting destroyed. And that kind of made me engage a lot more with, okay, like, why am I responding in this way? And how, how is the world responding in a different way? I don't know if that was kind of. No, absolutely. Dippy, and that's, like, that's, what I, that's what I wanted to put like touch on. Oh, cool. Is okay, that cool. You're absolutely right. And when I saw Notre Dame, I was like, okay. But then I saw the amount of people on social media who were like, oh my God, what a travesty. Right. And as as a member of the Pawnee Nation and who's like mm-hmm. finally, yeah. like like very closely attuned, like what's going on in Indian country, like mm-hmm. pipelines are being built and just bulldozing exactly. uh, ancestral sites. And like, no one cares. We had the, the water protesters for the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, shot at with rubber bullets by police, hosed in the middle of the night just to stop a pipeline going through their own ancestral territory. No one talked about it and no one cared. Yeah. And, you know, it's just absolutely ridiculous that no one cares about the uh, indigenous. Oh, my <laughs> God. That didn't work nearly as well as I had it tuned. I've been playing with was that. Was that a real recorder you had there? Uh, no, it's actually a Navajo flute. I have one. Oh, I can work. I can play Color of the Wind. I did it the entire time in the field. But oh also, I know God. it's absolutely Man. phenomenal. I love this thing. <laughs> well, well, I saw someone point out that like the and I, I'm, I'm not native, so I can't really speak on that end. But like. Uh, I had someone, because everyone on Facebook's like, oh man, I remember the Notre Dame. Like, you didn't care. But anyway. Everyone um, swarming to Twitter to post pictures right. of them in Paris. That, like, somebody cool. pointed out that like, you know, the grand, like that's like one of the symbols of Paris as like a, a, like a city identity, you know, like the Eiffel Tower, the Notre Dame. And somebody said like, it's kind of the equivalent of like losing like the Grand Canyon in America because we don't have things that are like that, that old, you know, and maybe it's not mm. the equivalent. But like when he said that, I was like, oh, you know what? Like. And like we were saying earlier, things are so much older overseas than they are here. We don't really like think of it that way. So like when he said like that, I was like, ah, I guess I should give more of a shit, you know, like, and I was like, hmm. but I, I really like what you guys are bringing up with the, you know, the access pipeline. Like nobody gave a shit. Nobody. It, was, it wasn't like, even on the news. It, yeah. It, and it was barely even on the news and it was exactly. just absolutely ridiculous. And like Keystone is coming up and Keystone has been a freaking nightmare <sighs> Um, oh, yeah, like, and that's going through the Pawnees, our ancestral homeland. And we're just like, great. Perfect. Here yeah. we go. Round two. No one's going to care. And, uh, yeah, it's yeah. fun. Building up on that. Like there's a, the amount of money that's been raised yeah. for Notre Dame to do these renovations compared to the amount of money that was probably raised for the Brazil museum or yeah. for these folks. Uh, like, still doesn't have clean water. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 No. And like, it's, it's, so it's like all these billionaires and, and millionaires you know are did you see supplying. disney pledged 50 million dollars to donate to it because they yeah, made a movie like, about it yeah it's like why, why why isn't that money going to like those folks who are suffering you know at at the dakota access pipeline or yeah. you know because they're brown places. that's yeah that, that's it, what it, it comes it, down to like the people that care about it in america in the united states are mostly of european descent and they see it as part of their heritage and it is such a monument 
um, to France and to the world itself. And this is why all of their, you know, attention is going to it because they see it as part of their heritage. Whereas like the Brazil Museum, like people in America are like, OK, great. Who cares about a bunch of Amazonian tribes that we've never heard of or looking at out west to the reservation systems and toying on with American Indians or the people that live in Flint, Michigan. Those don't they don't I want to I want to go as far to say as like they don't care about those people. But it's just not something that they need to that they're cognitively aware of or it's feel like, forefront. you know, it doesn't connect with them. It's like, OK, yeah, it's like exactly. not even on the radar. Yeah. Exactly. On, like on the kind of note of connecting with people is like one of the things that I think that we can use, like, again, like as a white person, it's my I, I think, at least for me, like it's part of my duty, especially when it comes to like anthropology and archaeology to do the legwork of helping educate other people when I can't, other white people when I can, so that that onus does not get put upon marginalized communities. Like, I think that we can use Notre Dame too as this way of being like, okay, you're sad about this. Now let's, let's talk about these, like, let's use this as a jumping off point to kind of really get into, you were so upset by this thing burning down. Think about these 800 year old trees, you know, that are important to this community this is the same thing. What, why are you upset about one thing and not about the other? And how can we use Notre Dame to, or Dame, or perhaps, see, I don't no, even, you, I don't know. Aren't you French? No. 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 Wow. You're French. You're, I'm, I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> my, last name, <laughs> my last name is, but I think it's French Canadian. So. My 23 and me says I'm a little bit French, but mostly Ashkenazi. So yay. There we go. Well, I mean, so, also I, don't know, I hope. I hope that like we can like use Notre Dame as, as a, a point at which we can try and make people more empathetic because and I, as garbage as that is that we have to use white people things to make white people. I mean, and I say that as being part of the problem, like that we have to use this to make people empathetic, like, but use it, you know, I don't know. Does that make sense? Like, no, absolutely. No, like it only, it only works to galvanize the public when it affects them and like you have to unfortunately use those lessons to like hey you see this thing that you guys were all really upset about now let's put that in the context of somebody else and like why don't we reevaluate how we think of other things yeah yeah, yeah. and also like i don't know put like i don't know whoever listened to podcasts if i've said something problematic like slide into those dms i will change <laughs> like it's my duty to learn <laughs> and yeah. keep learning you know i mean I think we can all still agree that it, it is a tragedy, like a, a monument, like burned down. You know? No, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. But also, like, it's been renovated multiple times. Yeah, bits and history. Pieces. Yeah, bits and pieces have been. You know, it's not like. Or and bits and pieces burned down. Not all of it. Yeah, the main stuff exactly. You know, like this. You know, it, Notre Dame is not in its original context either. Like it has gone through transformation over time and have been rehabilitated. You know, like wood rots. Who would have thought? And there's also million, millions and millions of pictures on Instagram that you can literally <laughs> use to recreate the exact. And they've yeah. recreated it in video games, haven't they? And like, you know, really? like, and like, I think like in Assassin's Creed, they do. I, I can't remember which one is the one where they do in kind of the France. Is it Brotherhood? Oh, uh, I think it might be. Yeah. yeah but I think there is a digital representation of it there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there we go. And like, thankfully, they do, you know, they were training for fire safety. So like the crown of thorns and other sacred artifacts were saved. So like and 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 paintings and artwork and stuff. Oh, so. right. Wasn't there like a piece of the, the cross from Golgotha there? I, I think so. don't know. I, I saw that. I don't know if that's like rumored, like, you know, like a hunchback lives up there, too. But like, <laughs> don't worry, he was uh, he was evacuated real fast. Cool. Oh, right. Probably. <laughs> I also posted a meme about him like burning the building down, and God like damn. I was like, "Is this too soon?" Dude, I, I love that meme, meme with, so that I, like, bad. Kind of used all the time, and I'm like, I crush it on there. Within ten minutes, I had negative fifty likes on that, and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> much too soon." What negative fifty? Um, yeah, like I think it was like negative like ten. But I think after fifteen in the negatives, like they just take it down because you're just incendiary. And uh, oh, wait. I thought I was clever. Like it was, was the guy from Reddit? Office Space, and he's like, "I'll burn the building down," and I was like, "Oh." Yeah, so again, I'm gonna take a step back and reassess my life next, <laughs> or not. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> well, as this podcast is called "A Life in Ruins," we are interviewing you about your life in archaeology. <laughs> if you had to do it again, would you do it? Oh God, of course. Okay, cool. I take everything. I love. I love this. It's what I'm meant to do. I think. I hope. Good. Dear God, I hope someone keeps paying me to do it. <laughs> That's the dream. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, Ella, thank you for telling us about your life in ruins. Um, how can our viewers <laughs> uh, learn more about you and, and find out more about what you're uh, talking about nowadays? Yeah, you can uh, please follow me on Twitter. I need the validation. Um, so that is at Ella underscore Bodwin. So that's at E-L-L-A underscore B-E-A-U-D-O-I-N. It's great. Pretty much that's where I am actively myself online, but I also highly recommend following the Human Origins Twitter, the Smithsonian. You'll occasionally see some uh, idiotic meme content that I cannot confirm or deny is me. So I can really highly recommend that one. You can just look for Human Origins. It's pretty much like the first one that comes on up. All right, perfect. Thanks, Ella, and we're out. Thanks for listening to a Life in Ruins podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at a Life in Ruins podcast. And you can also email us at a Life in Ruins podcast at gmail.com. Hey, guys. What? What human species is really the naysayer? I don't know, Connor. What is it? Yeah, I don't know. Homo no letty. Woo! Get out. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> God, that was horrible. This show is produced by the Archaeology Podcast Network, Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle in Reno, Nevada at the Reno Collective. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Do you guys hear that barking? God damn it, David. <laughs> yeah. Wait, I think it's just my fever. All right, continue. <laughs> Thanks for listening all the way to the end. This is Chris Webster with a quick reminder to check out archpodnet.com slash members to help support us in archaeological education and outreach. That's archpodnet.com slash members. Now go listen to more podcasts. 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 Now go listen to more podcasts.